My name is Kimberly Freeman. I'm the founder of KMF Enterprises. I'm so pleased today to be honored to interview a very good friend and colleague of mine in the industry, Jesse Bobrowski of Calvert Home Mortgage. So thank you for joining me today, Jesse. Um, Jesse will be speaking about real estate investing. I mean, there's been such a difficult landscape in 2023 and the tail end of 2022 and how he's been able to, with his niche product at Calvert, help agents, brokers, and real estate investors have a record year in a very difficult space. So Jesse, if you want to give yourself and the audience a brief introduction on yourself, and then I have a few questions that are key that people are curious about. Absolutely, Kim. Uh, thanks for having me today and looking forward to um, providing our listeners, hopefully some, some good knowledge to help them in their businesses. Uh, yeah, like, like you said, I'm Jesse Bogrowski from Calvert Home Mortgage Investment Corporation. Uh, with our company, I am the Vice President of Business Development, and our company is a mortgage investment corporation. Uh, our niche lending space is supporting Canadians with short-term uh, mortgage needs, and a big part of that is supporting real estate investors who are buy, renovating, and selling uh, residential properties, or who are buy, renovating, renting, and refinancing residential properties. Is it true that you have no appraisal requirements at Calvert? Um, we do have appraisal requirements, but we do them ourselves. Uh, so we take the burden off of the borrower in terms of the cost and turnaround times. And, and uh, we have uh, professional appraisals, appraisers who we have hired and who work for us and who are able to uh, perform appraisals at, at no cost and at extremely quick turnarounds. For example, um, we have some borrowers who, if they need funding tomorrow, we can literally appraise their property today and, and do a funding tomorrow. That would be very beneficial for bridge financing needs. I'm sure you see a lot of those scenarios. Yeah, we do see a lot of them. And, and I think uh, uh, particularly it's, it's an opportunity for us to better educate the market on uh, how we can support those, th those quick bridge funding, certainly. But uh, they are currently a decent amount of our business. We'd love for them to be more. You know what I love about your product? I know you've been around, is it, am I correct? 1974, your head office is in Calgary, Alberta? Yeah, we're, we're based out of Calgary. And when we were first founded, we were actually founded as a mortgage brokerage. But um, since 1981, we've been operating as a mortgage investment corporation uh, based out of Calgary. Uh, today, we're operating throughout Alberta and Ontario, um, again, with, with the main goal of short-term financing. And to us, short-term financing is really anything that there is uh, an exit strategy in place. Sometimes that exit strategy is, is a sale or a refinance that takes place in a week. Um, sometimes it, the, the, the plan may take longer, like a debt consolidation deal that could take, you know, up to a year or two to repair credit and and uh, and get us paid out with a more conventional long term option. Yeah, credit's really important. When you look at the bureau, uh, there's many times that there are. If you understand the purge dates, of course, for exits for any type of scenario, client or lender, there are purge dates for Equifax or TransUnion where you can even see oh, this was supposed to fall off, and you can also help the client restore their credit. So really important on that, especially with the short-term financing. But let's play devil's advocate here. So if, you, if your typical client is going to purchase a home, renovate, and say flip, that's the goal, right? So yeah. you really want to focus on people who are doing this for a living, perhaps want to get into the real estate market, flippers, contractors. I'm going to play devil's advocate. Oh, and by the way, I have been following you through the change 2020, 2021, 22, as you've been in, merging into the Ontario space. And when the rates started to rise, we all notice a shift in market correction. Okay. And inflation, of course. And many of the lenders out there make drastic changes to their program. One thing I do like about Calvert is you weren't panicking. You never panicked. You never made huge changes. You adjusted and used common sense throughout, but no one, it was still typically your same niche consistent. I really, really like that. But let's play devil's advocate for you. I think that human emotion is predictable. Let's call it the pink elephant in the room. Um, if you're going to sell a house, I think the issue is not renovating and purchasing. I think the issue is now people see higher rates and how are they going to sell that house? How would you explain the fears of people and eliminate and calm people down on that particular exit strategy? Yeah, 
Yeah, certainly. So, so um, as it relates to the psychology, um, it, it really comes down to analyzing what the numbers are. So, you know, where where we're supporting borrowers today that are flipping houses, um, it's a lot better environment than it was literally one year ago today. One year ago today, we were in a market that had really just begun the downturn um, in Ontario, and that downturn was very quick. Uh, you know, like like the bulk of the value lost, and I'm going to call it 20%, was lost within six months. Um, over the last three months, what we've seen is in most markets, they've stabilized in terms of we're not seeing price depreciation. And mm -hmm. actually, in most markets, we're seeing slight increases. A lot of that is due to very, very low supply. But going back to where the risk lies when people are trying to sell their properties, uh, the people that, that were at most risk are those that bought a year ago and that went to the market six months later in a market that was literally down 20%. Um, our best results were when there was still enough profit baked in. And, and typically with the lending that we're doing, where we're analyzing the borrower's success first and foremost, and success is how much profit they're going to make. In most instances, the 20% drop didn't completely wipe out profit for them. So they were fortunate where, yes, they made a lot less money than they were anticipating, but they still made some money. Now, of course, there were a lot more clients that made no money, um, and there are a lot more clients that lost money. But regardless, what we've seen in 40 years of doing this, and now keep in mind, we have been doing this business for 40 years, predominantly in Alberta, where you see um, where we've seen consistent rises and falls in the market. So we have really good data supporting what good decisions should look like. And usually your first loss is your best loss. So, so in these instances where, yes, the market um, was a drag on their ability to profit, it was still the clients who said, okay, address reality. We're in a market that's changed a lot. I'm going to lose some money. I'm going to sell the property and move on. What, what doesn't work historically for our clients or us in turn is when they say, oh, you know, the market's down, but it's going to come back. I'm going to hold on to this. I'm going to continue to pay you, you know, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13% interest and carry your mortgage until it does. Um, or I'm going to refinance and, and hold it. So, so I'm going to deviate from my plan. That's where we've seen clients suffer more pain than necessary. Um, so, so it's usually a matter of sticking to your plan and sticking to your numbers. Now, uh, some clients were able to successfully shift plans. So they were able to, you know, maybe they have a, a, a property that they were planning to sell and they've, um, they've shifted. Uh, they've maybe built an up-down up -down duplex type deal. They've rented it out. It's cash flowing and, and refinanced it. That's great. Um, that, 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 that shift in plan can work. But those are few and those are few and far between where, where it truly works. A lot of times what happens is these clients go into speculation mode and they hold it waiting for the market to come back. Uh, typically that's not a wise plan. And typically that only compounds um, what is already not the best situation. Now, what has been great in Ontario is luckily most of our clients had made so much money in real estate heading up to this drop that, right. you know, a loss didn't wipe them out. A loss wasn't uh, unexpected. You know, you're not always when investing, when doing business, um, you're not always going to make profitable decisions. And it's part of investing. It's part of doing business. So those borrowers, those, those real estate investor professionals that understand that have been our most successful. I think you also have to look at data. Everyone needs to talk, or if let's say they're working with a realtor, take a look at what price points are being sold within, let's say, 60 days. For example, in Niagara Falls, Ontario, anything between six and 800,000 typically sell on an average of 44 days. And that was a few months ago during the heat of things still. So now as things have leveled off, if you take a look at price points and comparable sales, that will also alleviate some of that nervousness, I believe, for exiting. Um, the other thing I was going to mention too, 
is we are in a shortage in Ontario. There's a housing shortage. When you have a housing shortage, you can put as many rules in place as you want or raise interest rates, which they're not very high anyways, because this was a low rate of over 10 years ago. That was like a record low, okay? People are still gonna buy houses. You're shifting the buyers. That's what you're doing. You're just shifting who's buying that property. But do your due diligence, can't live in fear. Now, there's another thing. When people know a little bit about something and not a lot about the topic, it, they just hear the headline, if you know what I mean. So there's been some discussion about capital gains and selling houses and without ownership for the year, within the year. So can you speak to that piece to alleviate some concern there? Like to me, a raise, you get a raise, you get taxed more, you're still making more money, right? Yeah, so so I believe, Kim, you're referring to, uh, I guess what, what the headlines have been is called the anti-flipping tax. Um, and, and really... The, the headline is misleading because it's nothing new. Um, what the CRA has done is, is just provided better guidance around um, what is eligible and what is not eligible for capital gains. So prior to um, this new guidance, the, the, the rule of thumb was you had to prove reasonability that you were living in the house um, in order to consider it a personal residence and in turn and order it in order for it to be um, to be not eligible for capital gains tax. Um, all that has happened here is the government has said, no, uh, you not only have to prove you've lived in, it, lived in it and that it is your personal residence, but you have to live in it for one year. Um, so, so really it's just, uh, it's just better guidance on what was already a rule. Um, the bulk of our, basically all of our real estate investors are not using the capital gains loophole to avoid cap to to avoid capital gains. Our investors are predominantly borrowing through um, an, through a corporation, and they're earning corporate income and paying corporate tax on that. Uh, we 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 weren't and never have been interested in supporting people who are avoiding capital gains tax by by hypothetically living in a property. So, for the bulk of real estate investors, this hasn't been a deterrent. Um, I think if anything, it's kind of from the public's perception uh, for people that were maybe loosely on the fence and didn't choose to read into what it actually was, it may have deterred them. But for the most part, people who are interested in investing in real estate really understand the implications of the tax um, and, and it hasn't caused any issues. But it's definitely been nice in that um, us as taxpayers I uh, now have clear guidance on what is and is not capital gains eligible. Beautiful. Okay. So if you weren't doing this for a living and you want to get into this market, what's your advice on how to get into real estate investing? Um, well, certainly like any type of investing or business, if you want to be successful, you have to own your success. Um, and owning your success to me means understanding what you're doing. Um, you mentioned understanding the data. Uh, that's critical. So, so how much, what, firstly, what, what method do you plan to invest in real estate? Uh, you know, there's, there's, there's everything from, from passive investing in a publicly traded REIT um, uh, all the way to, you know, developing land. Um, and those things require different skill sets, different knowledge bases, different capital requirements to do. Um, the people that we support in real estate investing are, are clients who are, who are building housing stock out of already existing housing stock that is underutilized. So, so our clients are buying properties that are run down, um, that haven't been renovated, that maybe can be can be duplexed or triplexed that are one unit. Um, so that the, they're picking up that underserved, underutilized housing product, um, renovating it, and then either selling it or renting it and refinancing it. Those are the people that we support. Uh, so if you're, if you're interested in doing that, it's important that you have a few key skill sets, uh, which is either, either understanding trades or being a tradesperson yourself because you're gonna have to manage construction um, you're going to have to build a budget uh, and you're going to have to execute. 
Um, you're going to want to have knowledge of the, re the residential real estate market that you're participating in. So again, understanding, okay, what, what do you want to buy and why? You know, is it, is it a single family house in Barrie that's at the mid to lower half of the market because there's not much supply there and it should sell quickly? Uh, is it a fourplex in Kitchener? Like, like you need to be an expert in that market in which you're participating in. And luckily there's a ton of data on it. Luckily, there's a ton of great um, experts who would love to help you, realtors, mortgage brokers, appraisers. Um, so again, you're gonna have to manage trades. You're gonna have to understand the real estate market and the ability to run your numbers. And you're gonna have to have some capital. So for us, our product really reduces the barrier to entry as it relates to capital in that we'll lend to borrowers with as little as $20,000 down. Um, provided again, most importantly, that they're going to be successful in their project. So when we say success, our underwriters are going to understand the borrower's plan, understand the borrower's experience, make sure that they're going to be able to execute and that their numbers are right. Um, it's 20 grand down. They're going to have the capital to do the renovations, and then they're going to have the capital to service the debt during our mortgage. So three big things you need to work with us and to be successful at investing in flips or burrs are, are an understanding of renovations and renovation budgets and project management, capital, and an understanding of the real estate market. Um, so that's really how you would get into it from the standpoint of flipping or burring a project. The financing, I guess, if you can borrow, they can blanket their own piece of real estate or if they have equity in, in their properties, then you would, I understand you have a very strong team there that would uh, educational seminars that walk them through if they're newer to real estate investing? Yeah, absolutely. Like not only do we have a ton of content on, on tips and tricks on how to value properties on walking them through literally how to analyze a property. We have all of that on our website and we'd love for um, those who are listening to this to go to the website for that. But any questions we're super accessible too. like, not only do we have all this content, but if you're interested we have a team of underwriters uh, and underwriter success associates. Um, and even like our, our marketing and business development people are real estate investors. So they're happy to pick up the phone and walk you through that. Uh, so yeah, we have, we, we want to make the process as accessible as possible to Canadians who are interested in it. Could you touch on your locations, your minimum um, population or your preferred areas right now? Yeah, we love to focus on urban centers, so to speak. Um, and now, ideally, we want to see people buying in property in, in locations with more than 50,000 people or 10 kilometers up. Um, the next would be 100,000 people or within 25K of. We will in in towns of 10,000 people, uh, but they have to be in the town. And the reason for that is, is uh, from our perspective, um, the more urban the center, the more people that you'll have interested as buyers or renters for the property, the more data there is to support the values. The more urban, or the, sorry, the more rural you go, the smaller town you go, uh, those centers are much more prone to big decreases. Like, like where we've seen the biggest decreases in Ontario through this downturn have been in rural centers um, have been in markets that that are away from the urban centers. So uh, because of the population base, when times are bad, those are the properties that have the least amount of buyers interested in them. They have the smallest market. And in some instances, in the really bad instances, there's literally zero market for it. Like there's a no bid situation, which is really risky. So for those reasons, we like to de-risk our borrowers from doing business in that area. And selfishly, um, we, we want to de-risk ourselves from doing business in those areas. That's fantastic. So really with your, I, I think that you really are well-rounded as a whole from team to process, to your niche, to your knowledge. So if you were a mortgage agent looking to fill their business for the year um, with one piece, imagine you found three people, three clients that do this for a living or they want to do it more than once. 
I believe it's one application is good for the whole year. And if that person conducts three flips, all right, transactions, that's nine more units to hit a record year with very minimal effort. That's pretty sweet. Yeah, you're exactly right, Kim. Like where we've seen a ton of success with brokers is just that where they, they understand our product enough to put it in front of real estate investors. Um, yeah, nine, nine would be ideal. Nine is, is, let's say right now, our average deal amount in Ontario is 500 grand. Um, so nine deals, that's 4.5 mil that you're adding to your book of business. Um, we, our fee is 2% and we split that with the broker. So now that's, you know, 1% on 4.5 mil, you've just earned yourself another 45 grand by simply introducing one niche product um, to your book. Uh, you know, looking at it even easier, if, if you just find one client that yeah. does three, that's another 50, you've just, you've just earned a $15,000 uh, increase to your, your compensation by that. So, and what's beautiful about these clients is, is while it is a niche product and sometimes they can be hard to find, once you have them, they're typically a client for, for a very long time. A lot of these real estate investors are going to do this for years and years and years. So not only is it, uh, not only is it an increase to your business today, uh, but it's an increase to your business for many years and, and in perpetuity. And another thing that we like to do at Calvert is ensure that that relationship always stays with the broker. So um, that relationship, the client ca can't come to us direct. It's, it's your client for life. Um, so, you know, it's basically what we've seen most successful is I makes an introduction. We do some business. We grow the confidence between the broker and the client where the client could almost come to the client in some instances just comes to us direct and we let the broker know, Hey, we're working with them. Here's what we need. Um, you know, it's half an hour of work for the broker and, uh, mm -hmm. and a nice, uh, a nice increase to their business. Beautiful. And you know what I like also about your product? Rates are irrelevant. They're only there for the, the time that they spend. If they're there for four months, it's 1.37 or 1.4% a month. So rates are irrelevant with regards to their project. Yeah, that is for the, for the professionals that we work with, we're a means to accomplishing what they need. Like a lot of banks yeah. are going to want to lend on the projects that we lend on. A lot of our competitors don't enjoy I don't think there's any competitors that really enjoy the lending that we're doing. No. So, um, so, so we're, we were looking to support the borrower um, support for us, you know, rates start at 9.99 today. Um, and depending on how much, how little you want to put down, they go up to 17%. But like you said, on a monthly basis, most of our clients are paying us out within five months. Yeah. So um, typically they're paying us well under 10% for our capital and they're just looking at it like a line item in their budget. So it's not, most of these clients are not rate sensitive. And, and if they are, they can put more down and, and, and bring our risk down and in turn drive rate down. One more tough question before, uh, before we go. It, have you had any people who've had issues with payments in this turmoil market? And how do you handle anyone that falls into arrears? Yeah, absolutely. We've had uh, payment issues. Again, we're in the business of, um, managing risk. And sometimes, especially when the market turns quickly on our clients, risk is going to increase. Uh, the way that we manage that risk when clients are missing payments is firstly to try to work with the clients. It's always in our best interest to work to a solution with the client who we have the loan with. Um, right. So as long as there's a plan in place to complete the project and sell the project in a reasonable time frame, we're absolutely going to work with our client. Over the last six months, sometimes we've had to get really creative. Like sometimes they've brought another partner. Sometimes they've, oh, I, I, hey, Calvert, I own this property over here. Could you blanket that and give me more capital and time to work through this? Um, uh, we are always open to working with our client. Where things break down and where it really sucks is when the client's not working with us. And we have to move to legal action. So if there's no communication or literally there's no plan, like, like, like they've, they've completely run out of money. There's zero other options. They can't complete it. Then we have to step in and, and, and sell it through power of sale. Um, yeah. 
again, we're always trying to work with the client. Uh, but in those rare instances, like for example, uh, over the last year, we've lent on 900 properties. Um, wow. To date, uh, through this downturn, we've, we've had to sell five through power of sale. And, uh, you know, we've lost a few hundred grand on that. Um, so we've been blessed in that we've been able to protect our risk. Uh, we've been able to minimize the risk for our clients. Uh, our clients for the most part have been profitable through this, but of course there's going to be those rare instances in, in, in ours, less than, you know, 1% where we're going to have to move to the worst solution, which is our clients and us lose money. Yeah, people have to understand where and how you get to that point. It is not okay for a broker or client to think that it's all right for you as the lender to be chase, 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 chasing for a conversation to have crickets, right? To land on crickets. And then at the 11th hour of the detrimental 90 months or sorry, 90 days for them to call and ask for a favor. Where was the communication? Open communication is important. Yeah, it's like, and and we're we think that we're real. Like we we at the beginning of the loan, we build a a relationship with the client, right? We talk to the client, we understand what the plan is, and typically by building that early, that allows us to work through difficulties. Um, yeah. And for the most part, the client's picking up the phone. We're working together, but every now and then, life happens. They their fear creeps in, and they avoid contact. And yeah, when when when. All we ask is that we work with our clients. And when there's not an opportunity to work with our clients, we have to uh, do what we think is best to manage risk. And usually that's- Well, I've done my best to try and find something wrong with you and your company and I failed. So on the, on the last note, is there anything else that you can say about yourself, the company or the team that makes you different in an ever-changing uh, mortgage landscape? Um, certainly what makes us different is, uh, what we've already talked about. I, I don't think we've really focused on the client experience that we provide. Like we have a team of very experienced expert underwriters who are not only underwriters, but business development experts. So they're working with you, the broker, they're going above and beyond. They are the decision maker. Um, they're going to be the one that from the broker standpoint, if you have ideas on how we could better support you for business development or, or working with your clients, we're open to that. So they're not just sitting there underwriting your deal. They want to go above and beyond to support you and your business. I think that's something really unique. And then the, we, we, we hinted on the turnaround time, but we can turn around deals literally today. And I know most lenders say that, but, but also it's a matter of funding the deals. So in Ontario, we can fund a deal tomorrow. We have lawyers that we work with um, on our side that can turn documents around today to your lawyer. And that's something really unique. And that's something that we have built a lot of process around and take a lot of pride in. So um, beyond that, I, I, I think those are the real team takeaways that I hope that uh, brokers and borrowers take from this conversation. So for a broker to contact you and your team for a formal presentation and to get a real hands-on tutorial on your flip analyzer, which just shows like all the costs involved and what is the client going to net and profit? What a wonderful tool that they, you allow them to brand it. What's the best way for brokers and agents to contact you? Um, so certainly they can, they can visit our website and contact us through that. Our website is uh, chmic.ca, uh, but also my business development manager, Ryan, uh, Ryan at chmic.ca. He's always available. He'll set it up. He'll make the experience effortless. Um, contact me, Jesse at chmic.ca, that's J-E-S-S-E at chmic.ca. And then we always love a good old fashioned phone call. Um, our I'll give our 800 number because we're talking, I think, predominantly <laughs> to Ontario people. So it's 1-888-752-4642. Ask for Jesse, ask for Ryan, ask for any underwriter and, uh, and we'll set you up. We also have a great um, Instagram. Uh, the goal of the Instagram is to educate brokers and borrowers on how to be more profitable with their businesses. Uh, you can DM us through there. Um, yeah, those are, those are the easiest ways to get a hold of us, Kim. Beautiful. Amazing. Thank you so much, Jesse. Really appreciate your time. Everyone, you need to learn 
all you can and contact Caliber. If you don't know them and you are crying about business this year, take a, a step in the right direction, reach out and learn their product today. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.